Thanks, Jamil. Okay. All right. It's a real pleasure to have Professor Tatsunori Hashimoto from Stanford University to start us off today. Tatsu's research uses tools from statistics to make machine learning systems more robust and trustworthy to properties that are going to be needed in any sort of these tools coming into public discourse of any sort. And he looks at them especially in the context of complex systems such as large language models. Topics of interest for him include how can we ensure that machine learning systems won't fail catastrophically in the wild? How does one ensure that LLMs, large language models, answer questions or generate text robustly out of domain? And how to ensure that these large language models and more generally machine learning based systems make fair and trustworthy predictions? These are all very important questions for the discourse, for the discussion that we're going to be having all throughout the day today. Tatsu received his undergraduate degree in statistics and mathematics from Harvard and a PhD from MIT. He was a postdoc at Stanford before joining the faculty in the computer science department at Stanford. And today he's going to be talking to us about opening the language model black box. Tatsu. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to talk to you all today about opening up the black box um, that's language models. So to set the stage, ChatGPT has become ubiquitous. Over 180 million users at this point have now interacted with large language models of some kind. And ChatGPT last year was one of the fastest growing consumer apps uh, out there. And these systems are incredibly capable. They have transformed the way in which we build natural language processing systems. And they are transforming the ways in which we interact with computers. And it's really difficult to imagine building something like a question answering system or to build a summarization system today without the use of some kind of large language model in the loop. And so we are really amazed and excited by the capabilities that these systems bring. And hopefully that's the reason, part of the reason, why you're here today. But at the same time, the reason why I'm here and the reason why I'm talking is that there's a big gap between the capabilities that these systems bring and the trustworthiness, how much we can rely upon these systems as building blocks for things like writing assistance or as part of our public discourse, as part of our society. And really, I think there are many key challenges we don't really know how we should be or can evaluate these systems. How can we track their usage in the wild and understand what's being done with them? And then more deeply, can we understand what's really important about them? Why do they work and how can we make them better? And really the science behind all of this is quite nascent because of the rate of development of this field. And I want to highlight in my talk several different kinds of trust issues that are going to be coming up with language models and some things that I've been sort of thinking about and studying in my own work. So one of them might be things like misuse and spam. So we have challenges like students using ChatGPT for their assignments, or there might be issues like mis or disinformation spreading. We have issues with evaluations. We see really impactful statements about how ChatGPT or other language models can pass professional exams. But when these models are trained on all of the internet, they may have already seen the answer key. And then finally, more complex, is the secondary effects that this will have on society. Language models aren't just some academic object. They're now large-scale user-facing products. And so they will shape and change society, and in turn, society will change it. And of course, now is in some sense the right time to be having this discussion. It's the early days of this technology, and there's efforts underway, like the executive order or the EU AI Act, that are going to be shaping the future of how this technology will develop and be deployed broadly in society. But at the same time, it's really even hard to discuss what the outlines of a solution to this might look like. And the reason is that we just don't know enough to really be sure about how to be solving these problems. And I want to talk about three things that we don't really know today. The first thing is that we don't know what's possible. What's the space of mitigations and algorithmic interventions that we can make on these systems? We don't know what's inside the models. What's really key to the functioning of these models that we can, for example, control or legislate? Finally, we don't know what's going to be coming towards us in terms of the downstream impacts. And these three questions are going to be the three things that I want to touch on in the three parts 
of my talk. And so I want to start with the very first part, which is that we don't quite know what's possible. Can we do things like reliably generate text, uh, detect texts that are generated by language models? Or can we uh, guarantee other types of desirable properties like factuality? And so that's really the starting point. I think this dream of detecting language model generated text is probably high on people's mind. The very first time you hear about something like language models can be used to create large scale spam or that they may be used to power misinformation campaigns, the first thing you might ask is, is there very easy, reliable ways of identifying such content and flagging it or removing it? That seems like a very basic capability that we might want. We might also want this capability for other reasons beyond these adversarial settings. We might want to be filtering model-generated content on the web because the web is what is being used to train these models. We don't want these models to be training on their own potentially flawed outputs. And for all of these reasons, there's a big amount of interest in detecting language model-generated text. And so if you're a statistics or a machine learning person, the very first thing you might think about is, well, you could build a classifier. There's a very long history and an entire field dedicated to detecting things, right? And so we might think, let's get a bunch of you know, AI-generated texts and a bunch of human-generated texts and build a very large, very powerful classifier that will identify language model texts for you. And of course, there's commercial services that will do this for you, GPT-0 being one of them. Um, and OpenAI used to have an AI detector um, of their own. And so you know, these products come with very nice claims, like 90 plus or 99 plus percent accuracy, right? Seems like we have a reasonable solution um, in hand. But really, that's quite, quite far from the truth. Um, if many of you have been following these stories, um, OpenAI quietly, or maybe not so quietly, pulled their AI text detector last year um, because of its unreliability. And really, I think we should all think of this as a pretty telling admission, right? The fact that the, these systems are worse being out there in the open than being shut down, right? That's how unreliable they are, and there's many stories out there in the wild of students being accused of cheating on the basis of these kinds of unreliable systems. Um, and there's reasons to believe that fundamentally this problem may be really challenging. You know, a number like on some benchmark, I have 90% accuracy isn't really sufficient to build a basis of some more reliable high stakes decisions um, like detecting LM generated text. So the question I really want to ask is can we say something more? Right? In machine learning, often we say things like, oh, you know, accuracies are all you can get. But in other engineering disciplines, like civil engineering or aeronautical engineering, you, know, you ask for much more. Right? You don't just go fly an airplane because it works 90% of the time. You know, we have things like five nines reliability and so on, and you might start asking questions like, you know, is it possible to guarantee you know, one in a million or you know, one in 10 million chance that we will have a false positive at detecting um, language model generated text. And this is the kind of thing that a lot of my research is, is very much interested in. And so I'll give you the outlines, a very high level view of why these kinds of things may be possible and why it's useful to think about in the space of you know, what can be done about and with language models. So the one line thought for why this is possible is that language models are inherently stochastic objects. What they do is they model the distribution of texts on the internet and, and there's many possible completions to any single input. You can conceptually think about a language model as rolling a dice every time it generates text to pick among these possible alternatives. And this randomness gives us a very powerful tool. We can algorithmically intervene on this dice roll, this metaphorical dice roll, and inject a very imperceptible but detectable bias into the randomness. And this allows us to watermark the outputs of language models. Um, and this was discovered about last, last year by Kirchenbauer and Aronson. And these are quite powerful techniques. They allow us to have these kinds of invisible, undetectable signatures in the outputs of language models. And the realization now is that because these watermark keys are in some sense secret and hidden from the user, you can ensure that random users won't accidentally trigger this detection uh, chance. And in fact, later follow-up work, including some authors here at Columbia, as well as my collaborators, um, Rohith and Percy, um, discovered that these watermarks can in fact be essentially distortion-free. So you're not losing very much at all in terms of what you're changing about the language model. And I don't want this talk to get very technical, but I do want to highlight just one thing that I think is very interesting. 
Um, you might think that watermarks are very much underpowered, but in the right kinds of settings, in the right kinds of very open-ended settings, you can actually get very, very powerful watermarks. You can show that just 10 words in an open-ended setting is enough for very small false positive rates. In fact, you could get a one in a million with maybe 20 tokens because these false positive rates decay exponentially quickly. And so that's really great. We have ways of now potentially detecting these kinds um, of, of uh, language model generated text and do so with the reliability that we would really want out of an engineering discipline. So are we good? Well, not really. Um, watermarks are not a panacea. They are far from even maybe a comprehensive or even you know, broad solution to the problem of language model generated text. And the reason is because they are far from robust to adversaries. Adversaries can just strip them away. If you have a good paraphraser, maybe even just another human, you can always paraphrase the text removing the watermark. You can also spoof watermarks pretending to be a language model vendor and inject your own watermark. So you can't really use them for provenance either. So these techniques are very powerful. They have very low provable false positive rates. At the same time, you can't rely upon them to just remove, uh, to detect language model generated text. And more broadly, what's I think interesting to me in this area is to think about what can be guaranteed, what can, be, what can we reliably do with language models. Um, and some other work that I've done shows that you can reliably detect things like benchmark contamination. When have language models looked at the answer key of a benchmark? Or do things like privacy preservation? Is it possible to build language models that preserve private information when you're fine tuning on particular data sets? And I think the reason why guarantees are interesting is that it's, um, sorry, one second. Um, I think the reason why these um, guarantees are interesting is that it's possible to get really precise, uh, uh, precise results out of them. We can watermark language model outputs, but adversaries can easily remove them. We can get broader guarantees on privacy and data, but for specific cases, not all the time. And under developing these kinds of guarantees are important because they outline the space of things that technology can solve for us. And the rest of it has to be handled with a broad collaboration between society and technology. Technology can't do most of the things that we want out of these systems. Now I want to talk about the second topic, which is what's inside the models. What makes them work? And in fact, who are they imitating? What kinds of biases may they be replicating? We know that data and training shapes the behavior of large language models. They're in some sense the core of what makes them tick. And so you might hope that we know a lot about what makes language models work. But in reality, this is far from the truth. This plot shown here, this is a transparency index by some collaborators at the Center for Research on Foundation Models and the, the Human Centered AI Institute at Stanford. And what this shows is that most of the LLM vendors release very few details about their data and their training procedures for their largest language models. And so in order to understand language models, we can't rely on sort of the goodness of these vendors, what we really have to do is to understand these systems by building it. And so there's been many efforts in the open source community to build models, both base models, which are these gigantic resource intensive, I would say autocomplete systems that are needed to build large language models, as well as the fine tuned chat models that you can actually interact with, including some works like Alpaca and Vicuña, which are some of the earliest works in replicating this pipeline. And I'll just highlight really one work that we've done here, um, which is the alpaca sort of trio of systems, which replicated this alignment process, the process that chat, uh, the OpenAI and others use to make large language models follow human instructions and to refuse potentially harmful commands. And we were able to show that a combination of what you know, these industry people have been talking about, like supervised fine tuning and reinforcement learning, can actually replicate uh, sort of the behaviors of ChatGPT. And really the, the result that I want to highlight here is that we can actually do open source replication of a lot of these kinds of procedures. At the very bottom of this table here is Llama 7B, a model released by Meta last year. And we combine this with supervised fine tuning, sort of one step of the alignment pipeline, and we get to the middle of this table in terms of win rate versus a, a reasonably good uh, model from OpenAI. And then finally, applying PPO, which is this reinforcement learning procedure, boosts the win rate further. And this was one of the first replications showing how alignment um, could actually make these models um, work as well in terms of instruction tuning um, as these closed source API models. Another important um, aspect of this is to understand these models by evaluating them externally. Um, there's been efforts like Helm at Stanford, as well as the Open LM leaderboard by Hugging Face um, here in New York, um, which 
perform broad coverage benchmarking of many models so that we can understand what their capabilities are across many different tasks, like coding or multilingual tasks, and so on and so forth. But the real challenge, I think, in the future is going to be what to measure. And there's going to be a lot of things that aren't traditional NLP tasks that we're going to need to measure. And I'll highlight one example, which is something like opinions and values that are embedded in language models. Um, two of my postdocs last year started going down a line of thought that's something like, language models imitate text on the internet. These texts are written by people. And so language models, in some sense, are imitating various people on the internet. And who are they? How can we identify what opinions and values are embedded within language models? Um, and the experiment design that was quite interesting was to take existing public opinion polls, such as uh, surveys from the Pew opinion polls, and to pose them to language models and compare their outputs to um, various demographic groups' responses. And what we find is actually a pretty clear set of results that shows that the alignment procedures, the things that are supposed to make models usable and safe, really show distinct shifts in terms of what demographic groups these models are aligned with. Uh, models that have gone through alignment are much more aligned with higher education, higher income, liberal demographic groups. Really showing the importance of thinking carefully about these interventions and what they're actually doing to the models. But of course, I think I want to highlight something that's really important. These kinds of benchmarks are not really been done in the, or not being done in the wild. They're very much isolated, sort of in the lab kind of experiments. And really significant work remains to be done in understanding how these kinds of results, say on opinions or values, might actually reflect in the wild when users are interacting with these systems and actually using them. And so what I want to highlight here in this section is that there's going to need to be constant work and constant vigilance um, in order to understand how these language models work. And we need to have external pressures um, from civil society and people like you and I in order to try to get LM vendors to give us uh, much more information about these models. Okay, finally, I want to close on the downstream impacts. Um, drawing an analogy to social media, we know that the history of social networks tells us that complex interactions between society and technology is where a lot of the biggest risks are going to happen. In social media, we know that feedback loops have resulted in really complex phenomena that we couldn't predict and cannot control, things like polarization or amplifying various kinds of protests. I'm going to say that language models are going to need, lead to new, much more complex feedback loops. Things like data feedback loops, in which models are generating data, which goes on the internet, and then models then train on these data sets, creating complex positive feedback loops. And I want to give you one example of this before I close, which is that because generative models produce data, in some sense, that they're going to, in the future, maybe train on, this can amplify biases. If you have a data set, that's filled with, say, political or gender biases, and models train on this, depending on the training procedures, they may amplify these biases, and that may become part of a future training data set. And in work last year by uh, one of my students, Rohan, we show that across a wide range of settings, like image tagging and language modeling, these sort of observations hold true. If your, a model is training on its own outputs, it can, in fact, slowly but surely amplify biases. And so this was a short section, because I think the future is quite uncertain. But what I want to highlight is the importance for vigilance, that we need to be thinking about potential ways in which LLM-based systems can really degenerate. And vendors really need to start providing transparency in terms of how people are using these models, because that's going to be a core part of how we think about and understand these systems. So I want to end on a, on a call to action. Um, I think now is the right time to start thinking about and calling to action for language models. But first, we need to do some work understanding these systems. What are the reliable tools that we can rely on for mitigation? And what's sort of the core pieces that we should be working on and trying to sort of uh, regulate and change? And finally, what will the future look like? What is the important downstream impact? So those are the three themes that I covered today and the things that I hope you take away. Um, and this will really take an interdisciplinary effort. The very first section that I covered really highlights the fact that technology is very powerful, but also very limited. And so for almost everything else, we require a large-scale interdisciplinary effort to be solving uh, these problems. And I'm happy to take any questions. And the work here was made possible by my many students um, and the various groups that I work closely with.
Okay. All right. So the questions are coming in, and I don't want to hog up your time by my question, so I'm going to start with the audience ones. What can be done to mitigate the scenario where an individual's original writing accidentally coincides with the watermarks and is deemed to be generated by AI? I think you addressed that briefly, but it'd be... Yeah, that's a, that's a really important and interesting sort of technical question. So the way that watermarks work is kind of similar. It has a cryptographic analogy to it. So there's a secret key that's first generated, um, and you can think of this as a really big random number. And the user doesn't know the secret key, and so has no real way of guessing what the secret key will be. Um, and so the chance that you will randomly, accidentally guess the secret key, you can make arbitrarily small. You can make it a million and one, you can make it 10 million and one by making the secret key sort of longer and have more bits. Um, what that does is that it makes it harder to detect the watermark. The lower the false positive rate, the more words that you need that are watermarked before you can detect um, the watermark. And so there's trade-offs involved, but in terms of false positives, you can very precisely control these things with all these schemes. So I want to step back and ask a, a question that sort of is re more relevant to the discussion here. How do you see LLMs interacting with sp free speech concerns? Do you see them bringing up new questions or this is more a scale issue? Yeah, I'm, I think language models are going to be bringing up all sorts of free speech issues, I think. Um, one of the things that you, know, you and I had discussed earlier you know, is in the context of defamatory speech. Um, you know, language models, by virtue of their hallucinations, um, where they make up facts, um, can, can cause def uh, defamatory speech. But in the US, because of strong First Amendment protections, there's a very good chance that actually, you know, language models aren't liable for defamation. OpenAI is not liable for defamation. In fact, no one is liable for defamation, even though the system is producing what you might consider defamatory speech. Um, and in other ways, you know, I think language models may become an important part of writing. And so, you know, you don't want to just clamp down on language models, you know, as a, as a tool that allows you to express uh, speech. And so I think there's like complex interplays about language models as a tool to help with speech versus language model as a real stress test of what it means to do uh, free speech. Towards the very end of your talk, you mentioned that technology won't be the only solution, that it would have, be, have to be an interdisciplinary approach. So what kind of societal effort, efforts do you think would be necessary for us to reap the benefits of LLMs, or more generally generative AI, and at the same time mitigating some of the, let's say, catastrophic aspects of these? Yeah. I'm, I, I wish I had a clean answer for you because oh, you know, that would be the, the solution answer. in some sense to the, to the symposium. But um, I, I think some of the, there's close mirrors with what people are asking for in social networks. Um, things like large, like substantially more transparency into how usage is being done, um, close connections between sort of civil society and these like large social network platforms that allows people to sort of understand is there disinformation campaigns sort of going on on these platforms. I think similar kinds of questions will rapidly arise with platforms like ChatGPT. I mean, there was recently, you know, announcement by Microsoft and OpenAI saying, you know, um, foreign states were using ChatGPT uh, for nefarious purposes and they, they shut that down. Um, in the future, I think it's not going to be something that only platforms decide. It, should, it will really need to be a broader question of who decides, you know, what kinds of things get shut down on these platforms. I guess our, our legal colleagues are going to be talking about those aspects as well. Um, so one of the questions that came in from the audience was that, the talk that you gave seems to remind people of explainability, interpretability, and transparency type of questions um, that have been raised for machine learning models. So how, how do you see the discussion in LLMs being similar to and potentially different from what happened for, let's say, neural networks? The same kind of questions were there as well. Right. I think there's a, a few, you know, there's many things that are similar, which is uh, there's a deep desire to understand these systems so we can control them in, in various ways. So that part, I think, remains the same. And interpretability is an important part of that. Um, what I think is different is several components. One is the generative nature of the system. Because it's generative, you can now have things like feedback loops where the outputs go back into the inputs. That's different. You can also have things where, you know, the training data from content creators are now being displaced by the language models. That's very different. Um, and then finally, I think a thing that's quite different about language models is that they're user-facing products. In, in deep learning, often, you know, these were part of like large-scale industrial systems where you had precise input, hopefully precise inputs and outputs. Now it's sort of affecting how people like read and think in everyday sort of interactions. And I think that's going to be a very, very different landscape. 
Right, and do I have time? One more question, okay. So uh, the other question I wanted to ask was, how do you see technologies that have been developed for generative text potentially extending to images or videos? Are there, are there things, because there, some of these watermarking may not directly transfer some of the issues that might be much more vague in some sense. Right. And what are your thoughts about what's been happening there and what could potentially be happening in that space? Yeah, so, so as, a, as a more language-oriented person, my expertise is weaker for those, just to be clear. Um, but I, I do think, yeah, the, the watermarking mitigations are different. In some sense, actually, the image side has much stronger watermarks in play than the, the language side. That's actually much more nascent. Um, and I think the other thing is that for images, right now, I think um, the, the outputs are a little bit more detectable than text. Just because you can look at things like high frequency effects, there's much more bits mm -hmm. in an image and in a video. Um, so it might be the case that more photorealistic, undetectable outputs are slightly further away than text. Because of the discrete nature of, of tokens, it's a lot easier to sort of have something that looks human enough in the space of text. And I think that's one issue and one danger. All right. Thank you so much, Tatsu. Thank you.